You're listening to episode 35 of the D6 Podcast. Here's the encouragement I give you. The shortest distance between your child's heart, your grown child's heart, and Christ is you. Parents need to own that they are the primary disciples of their child. Our goal in parenting is not for our kids ultimately to get a great education, as good as that is. Our goal is not for them to be great athletes. Our goal is not for them to go on great dates and have, find a great husband or a great wife. Our goal is not for them to have a great career with a great job, making great money. Our goal is for them to love a great God. A great God, a great God. A great You're great listening God. to the D6 Podcast. Here's your hosts, Ron Hunter and Jeremy Lee. This is the podcast that helps you build an excellent family ministry in your church. Uh, Ron, I hope it's, uh, we are, we just passed Christmas and I hope you had a great Christmas with your family. Absolutely. Always enjoy Christmas and uh, connecting. We have a tradition in our uh, home where we give thoughtful gifts. It's probably my favorite time of uh, the Christmas area. We established this many, many years ago where we max it out around $10, but I know all of us cheat a little bit and may go up to 15 And the thought is they have to figure out something that would be thoughtful to give. It could be a craft. It could be a picture they put together in a frame or you know something they get, but they put a lot of thought into it. It's not just, hey, that was on your list, and you go and buy it for them. We, we tend to you know, create lists, and we just get fulfillment gifts at Christmas. And those thoughtful gifts kind of break that monotony and it's the last gifts that we share in exchanging of gifts, and it's my favorite time. Mm. So it's been a tradition for, for for a number of years. Yeah, our favorite tradition is the hundred dollar tip. We, uh, my family, we go uh, on Christmas uh, uh, on Christmas lunch or Christmas dinner because usually we don't want to cook anything else at that point, and we go find a, a restaurant that's open. The poor people that are working at a restaurant on Christmas. What what restaurants do you typically find open? Uh, you know, last year it was like a sports bar near our house that that was open. The year before it was like Chili's. I don't think we did that on Christmas, uh, but uh, there's always a Waffle House open. You can mm, count on that. That's right. Uh, and so it's fun. We before we go in, we find a table that we can see from a window outside, and then we go sit at that direct table. And whoever our waiter or waitress is, we leave them a hundred dollar tip, and we run out of the restaurant. And we get in that window and we watch them. And uh, it's one of my, my boys just they 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 just freak out whenever the wait because there's always a great reaction. You know the waiter wow. or waitress is really like what what's going on and it's so fun. So uh, yeah, Christmas is awesome. What a great challenge for our listeners. Yeah, and so uh, these traditions that we're talking about are born out of family. Family usually begins with a marriage. I think that's how it's supposed to start. And that's how we're going to talk today. Uh, Dr. David Clark is going to tell us how we can have a thriving marriage. And I think those of us that are married are interested in that topic for sure. And then you are going to be talking about with Mr. Ron Deal. Yes, we're going to be talking about broken families, step families is the term that uh, Ron is most known for. Um, I come from a broken home, and so... What Ron says really resonates with with my life, having grown up in in that situation. So, and our ministers today are ministering in that world. I mean, half of our families, or nearly half of our families, are broken step families, and our kids are uh, have those challenges that come with that. So, marriage and family is the theme. Hopefully, this is one of those episodes you can share with the folks in your church, maybe because the folks that are uh, good, you're going to hear from today are some of the leaders in the field, and so they're going to have tons of great encouragement for the folks that would be listening, and I hope that it encourages your marriage and your family. So after the break, we'll be back with Dr. David Clark. Are you looking for the right conference to attend this year? The D6 Conference is a family ministry conference designed for your entire ministry team. Come here from over 30 speakers and network with churches that share your passion for reaching families. Family ministry isn't just another program. It's one of the most important things your church can do to make a difference in your city. At the D6 Conference, you'll be inspired and equipped to take your family ministry to the next level. To learn more about the D6 Conference, just go to d6conference.com. Well, 
Well, if you're in family ministry, that means you have to care about marriages at some level. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, helping couples build a thriving marriage. And uh, we're really going to be talking about those couples. Also, they're kind of on the verge of divorce and how to bring it back. Uh, and it's that kind of hope that I love about our guest. He, he's, his resources offer tons of hope. We have Dr. David Clark with us today. He's a Christian psychologist, a popular speaker, and a successful author. If you look him up, you'll see that he has written tons of great books uh, on the topic of marriage and saving your marriage from divorce. He's a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. He holds a Ph.D. in clinical psychology. Basically, really smart, loves to help marriages. Glad you're here, sir. Thank, Thank you for you. being with us. Thanks, Jimmy. My pleasure. Yeah, super smart. Super and, smart. And caring. Thank you. Thank well, you for, uh, yeah. you know, that's, I love the confidence. <laughs> okay, so the folks listening to this are age-graded ministers, okay? They're working in churches, working with families and parents. Uh, and uh, that means that you are going to be somebody that they love to hear because they are helping marriages that are in trouble. Uh, so you write on marriage, you write about saving marriages. Let's start with this. If I'm an age-graded minister and I hear a rumor that a married couple in my church is considering divorce, what do I do? I've always wondered this. Do I go say something or do I just let it be? What do I do? I would meet with that couple just as soon as you can, indicate that you've heard something and that you're concerned about them, and chances are good that they are struggling. Because churches are small small cities and small communities, and so that you're probably onto something, and you're offering hope for them. Now, one person in that relationship is going to want to save it, one wants out. That's, that's a classic scenario. So you're going to work on the one that wants out. What's okay. going on? That's where you start first. That's it. And, they, and, and if you get into a conversation, they're going to have a series of excuses, not one of them biblical, to end the marriage. All justified, and they're kind of ready to go. So you have to be ready to counteract those those, they're basically lies, distortions. But the main thing is hope. We're going we're gonna to come alongside of you. And if you're the minister, I'm, you, you'll say, I'll help you. I'm going to come alongside you. Maybe a mentor couple you could hook them up with. People get divorced when they don't have any support. So we're going to come alongside. The person that's being divorced needs support, but the other person needs support too and probably confrontation. But you're going to have a clear plan of action in addition to support. That's where my books come in handy. Mm, okay, so that leads me right to your book. It's called, listen to this title, I Don't Want a Divorce, A 90-Day Guide to Saving Your Marriage. Okay, how in the world can a couple turn around their dying marriage in just 90 days? Because I say they can, Jeremy. Because <laughs> <'cause, laughs> doggone it, we're going to. I have been at this 30 years, and I don't write a book until I know something works. It's not theory. It's, I've done this with scores and scores of couples over five to seven years. Then I put a book together, so I know that process works. If God's involved and we have two people at least willing to try and they'll follow these series of progressive steps, boom, their marriage will turn around. Now, the whole process takes longer than 90, but 90 turns the ship. And they're back uh, in church. They're focused. They think they, they know they can make it. And they've got the skills that I've taught them, most from the Bible, that will help them create a great marriage. Can, I, can you give us a broad picture of what the 90 days looks like? Sure. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying. I know they can get the book for the details, but... Just kind of lay it out as a... Yeah, they have I, to buy my, the book. I'm not going to give this away for free, Jeremy. My, what are you? <laughs> my, my mind is sitting here wondering, what in the world are we doing in these 90 days? Here's how it starts. I'm sitting with a couple. The very first thing is, and, I, and this is a homework assignment for the second session, I want you to look in the mirror. Let's say it's you and your wife, Jeremy. You're going to look in the mirror, and you're going to write out what I call a letter of responsibility. What have you done in this marriage wrong? What are your weaknesses? What have you brought to the table? You can always see what's wrong with your partner, and you're probably right, but it doesn't make any difference because you can't do anything about that. So I make them do that first assignment, and that starts off on the right foot. What have I done wrong before God? Weaknesses, sins. Then we go from that to the top two. We're going to go right away to meeting needs. You're going to be able to ask your wife, honey, what, what are the top two areas I need to work on? Well, it's going to be your greatest weaknesses, but that's where we're going to start to work. Even small steps in those areas so we can bullseye it. We go from there to communication skills. I, I really literally forced them to have three to four 30-minute couple talk times a week. I choreograph the whole thing. We do it in session. They practice in session because they don't know how to talk to each other. That's total. If they ever knew, they've, they've lost it now. I teach them how to resolve conflict because they haven't got through a conflict probably in months or years. Then we start talking about meeting other needs and other, other issues from their past, for example, how you were raised and previous marriages. If that stuff hasn't been resolved, all that floods in. So it's just boom, 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 and it's, it creates a flow. Of course, I'm a confident person, so I know it's, it's going to start to work, and they start to get some hope. Mm. So that's, that's, the, that's the gist of it. I love that. Uh, uh, momentum. You're building momentum. It seems like what it's all about. I am. You'll, the couple doesn't control the session. I do. That's, that's my job. 
Okay, so what are the recommendations to age grade ministers for the kids and the teenagers in ministry whose parents are divorcing? So how do we how do we minister to the kids? Well, we got to come alongside them too. The bottom line is if you're, you're involved with a kid and you know that their folks are going through a divorce, you, again, you come alongside that child, you're going to give them hope. Now, you don't give them any false hope. You don't say, oh, I don't think your folks are going to get divorced. Mm. Let's just pray about that. Uh, no, let's assume they're going to get divorced. That's reality. And they begin an adjustment. And you can tell that child in some special meetings and coming alongside of him or her, you're going you're gonna to go through denial. I don't, my folks aren't going to get divorced. I think I'm going to pray for a miracle. Well, let's pray. God could do it, but let's don't have much hope. You're going to be angry, angry at them, angry at, uh, at um, maybe another person that was involved in breaking up the marriage, angry at God. We're going to get you through that. So you're letting them know what's coming, in other words. You're going to be depressed and very sad because it's the loss of your family. We want that child to go through those steps, and then you're going to, go, you're going to get into acceptance. So you lay out what's going to happen. And that gives the child some kind of control, and you keep and you just walk them through those steps. Hmm. You're also going to tell him, which is the absolute God's truth, God is going to get you through this. You're going to wrestle with him in this, but you're going to be a better person and a better Christian afterwards. That isn't trite. That's true. It's just going to be hard to get there. Hmm. Love it. Okay. Um, you also wrote the book, What to Do When He Says, I Don't Love You Anymore. Interesting that you chose he. I want to hear about that. Why didn't you say she or I guess if you just chose one? That's because women buy books, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> just telling you. <laughs> Because it was awesome. Because it could be the it could be the lady, obviously. <laughs> obviously, okay. So, what do you do when that happens? When they say, "I don't love you anymore," what's the response? Well, the first thing you have to believe is your your spouse is done. When you hear those words, they're not kidding. They're done. They're not. They'll act confused or I'm not sure. No, they've got all their ducks in a row. And 85 percent of the time, Jeremy, maybe even 90 in my experience in 30 years, they got somebody else. They are in an affair, emotional and or physical. So you know those things going in. You're going to gather your support team. And you're gonna you're gonna start pushing back. I'm not. You're not done with me. I'm done with you. Now, no divorce. I never recommend that. But this is a a very hard in your face pushback because that can shake the center up. They want to be your friend. It's too bad that this has gone wrong. Would you help me get divorced? You're not gonna help them. You're gonna shove it back at them. You got your support team operation. You're gonna Matthew 18 that person. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Individual confrontation, one or two witnesses from your support team, your pastor, church leaders, and then you're going to shun and you're going to separate. So it is hardcore in your face. i got to save my marriage. No pursuing, no begging, no, gosh, it's my fault. None of that works. So if you see me, it's going to be tough. Mm. That's what that book is. It is a manual for just going after your spouse and shaking them up. We're trying to save that person, too, because they're ruining their whole life. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's that's great. That's cool. Okay, so you have another book called Married but Lonely, which talks about avoiding a marriage that merely exists. Now, that describes a ton of marriages. Man, uh, it sure does. Uh, how do so many marriages get stuck in the existing? And then I'm assuming this is, is about intimacy and developing intimacy. Is right. that, so let's talk through right. that. It's really the nature of the base, Jeremy. We, we get married. We got a man and a woman. That's our first problem. Tremendous differences. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how to communicate, really. We don't know how to resolve conflict. Nobody ever taught us. And the breakdown of the family means that even fewer people know how to do that. So when the love and infatuation runs out and we got a couple of kids and we don't know what we're doing, we can't resolve conflicts, we're in trouble. Plus, add to that, there's one spouse in the marriage that is an, what I call an intimacy avoider. Usually the guy could be the woman, and I'm, I automatically resist intimacy. So all those factors just kill a marriage. Well, that's the point when you really begin to build a marriage. My wife and I got there. No, no one was getting divorced, but we had lost it. So it's like, what, what are we going to do? Well, that's when we developed these series of steps, Sandy and I, they're in the book, that brought the whole thing back. I was the intimacy avoider. Hmm. I'm an expressive guy. I'm, I'm a psychologist, for heaven's sake. I'm giving marriage seminars, and my own marriage, it wasn't that great. So we learned how to do it together. You can turn hmm. the whole thing around. Mm, intimacy avoider. That's that's pretty key. Okay. Um, the 10 most, uh, you wrote the 10 most outrageous couples in the Bible. Uh, I don't expect you to give me all 10, but I want a couple. Give me, because th th I thought this was a really neat title. I'm actually really interested in who these could be. Uh, so maybe two or three or four or five. How many you got for me? Yeah, let me give you some. That was a lot of fun to write that book. From a psychologist's point of view, their stories give us so many great messages. What not to do and what to do. Our start with Adam and Eve. They're the first couple, of course. And they teach us that you have to team up against sin. You know, they're standing in front of the tree, right? And, and, and Adam's right there. And Eve falls. They didn't talk about it. They didn't discuss it. They weren't a team against that sin. They knew what God had said. So the moral in my mind is for each 
couple to be very honest about their sinful areas, their potential for weaknesses. People don't want to do that, but if you don't do that, you're going to fall. So God wants us to team up against that. Whether it's, in my case, it's workaholism. I am a workaholic. My name is Dave, and I'm a workaholic. And I got to watch that. I got my best friend watching me, Rocky. I got Sandy watching me. Sandy knows about that, so he, she tends to, has to watch me. Sandy's very a very intense person and can be very impatient. That's, uh, I hope she doesn't see this. Anyway, no, no, she already knows. I know that. So I, I'm, I'm helping her in that area. So if we will team up, it could be sexual sin. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be all kinds of things, jealousy. Let's be honest about that and then team up against the sin. Mm. That's the main moral for them. Okay. Adam and Eve, what, who else? So, Solomon and Shulamith are one of my favorites. The Song of Solomon. Oh, man. Talk about a positive book. They had a wonderful love. Um, they were very positive. They said positive things all the way through the book, uh, complimenting character as well as physical attributes, which is key. They were able to resolve the one conflict they had. They were able to resolve that, so the book teaches us how to do that. They did positive things together. Their communication was wonderful. They were very honest and open. They made time to talk in private places. So all those great positive principles from that, from that book. Okay, one more. I'm going to ask for one more. What's okay. another one? I'm going, to, I'm going to end up with Joseph and Mary, the last couple that I deal with in, in the New Testament and in, in the book, and just all the things they went through. I mean, they faced incredible odds, unbelievable trauma, all the things that happened. I mean, jo any other ma Jewish man in the world does not go with Mary. It would have been humiliating. It would have been awful. It was insulting. Nobody believed that the virgin birth. What are you kidding me? He stayed with her because he, he was faith in God. So they have God at the center of their relationship. It got them through all those difficult times. Of course, they raised the Son of God. So the moral is we got to keep God at the center of our marriages, praying together, reading the Bible together, attending church, serving together. That's the Joseph and Mary moral. Man, okay. That was good. That was a nice appetizer to the meal of that book. Because, you've got to have uh, the book now. They've got well to have done. that book. Well done. Okay, latest project. You got anything you're working on now? I do. i got okay. a brand new book coming out next February called Honey, We Need to Talk. Okay. Men hate that title. Women are going to love it. Because <laughs> <laughs> women buy books, right? Exactly, Yay! baby. <laughs> it's all about, it's very practical communication. It's very hands-on, short chapters, and I just, I, I, I teach them a principle, and then they practice it, and they teach it, and they practice it, and they talk about how it went. I'm pretty excited about that book. It's going to be good. That's awesome. Well, uh, you have been fabulous, just to be honest. Your energy you brought to this interview, I can't thank you enough for. If you guys want to follow Dr. David Clark's ministry, you can go to davidclarkseminars.com, and churches can bring you in, right? Churches can. Yeah, uh, there's a whole bunch on that site. I went and checked it out myself. It was well worth your time. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Jeremy. What's it like to be a member of the D6 Leader Network? Well, what if I told you that you could hire an intern for your ministry that would plan your sermon series each month and create amazing graphics to help promote it? What if that same intern helped you train your volunteers by writing an online teacher training every month that includes a fully produced video without you even having to touch it? What if that same intern created a fully designed parent resource that they can actually use to help them spiritually lead their family? What if that same intern was able to get you access to every main stage talk, breakout, or interview D6 has ever done at their D6 conference for your own training and development? That would be the best intern in the history of the world, right? Well, becoming a member of the brand new D6 Leader Network is like hiring an intern to do all of that and more for around a dollar a day. We make your life easy. We make awesome easy. If you are a minister, you can go to d6leader.net to learn more. I hope you understand that uh, when we hear from people like uh, Dr. Dr. Clark, um, it's it's a reminder that we all need tune-ups at times. Uh, we listen to these kinds of messages. I know you do a lot of counseling in your church if you're listening to us, but there's times we need to break and, and kind of uh, tweak and get a, a tune-up in our own marriages and seeking out somebody like Dr. Clark, and, and there's a number of places we can find good, solid, biblical Christian counselors to help in our ministry and even in our marriages. And uh, I would encourage you to do that. As we uh, transition over to Ron Deal, 
I want you to hear that uh, there are times when people go through uh, challenges, and it can be multiple, multiple areas. But one of the issues whenever we make uh, mistakes or we go through a valley, on the other side of it, we think that people don't look at us the same way again. And he uses the term that one of the biggest uh, emotions that step families feel is shame. And he talks about how deep this runs. I want you to especially hear that because that's what you're ministering in and among. And if you can help uh, a person come to grips with that emotion and how they take it before Christ, it will elevate your ministry to step family. So let's listen to Ron Deal. We're sitting here with Ron Deal. I want to thank you, Ron, for joining us for the D6 podcast. Uh, you've it's been always a good to be with you, Ron. Thanks for having me. Well, likewise, our our people always love hearing from you. You have uh, a unique topic that is very needed today, and there's not enough people out there talking credibly about this area, and that is with uh, blended families, step families, uh, divorce that that whole area that's non perfect, that non standard side. Uh, you have been in ministry for 28 years, and specifically 24 of them dealing with step families. Um, I know you would be embarrassed if I kind of walk through the number of books that you publish, but it's easy to say that you are the most widely read author dealing with step families today. And if you're a ministry leader and you do not have at least three of Ron's books in your library, you're missing an opportunity to minister to families. I'm just going to tell you, you need to go out and buy them uh, right now. He's been married personally for uh, uh, 30 years, three boys. And he records a uh, kind of a one-minute uh, family life blended moment uh, where he's talking on this topic and it is uh, distributed over 600 outlets. If you don't know where to find that, you can go to familylifeblended.com. So, Ron, thank you for being with us today. Um, how is it that you, uh, you ventured into this, this arena of step family? You know, a lot of times we find our passions through a personal story. This is an exception. Uh, it is not my life. I, my parents were married 60 years, almost 61 years, when my mom passed away mm -hmm. just about a year ago. And my three siblings, they're all in first marriages. I got into this because I was in ministry in a local church. And I was doing marriage and family ministry. And I thought we ought to minister to people across all family types, shapes, and sizes, from the cradle to the grave. And if you're going to do that, you better have a single parent ministry. You better have a step family ministry. And my training as a marriage and family therapist, uh, you know, gave me a good background to think about how to do step family ministry. But I, I really didn't know how to put it together in the beginning, and it, it took a while and a number of years. And finally, I figured out a few things and just started sharing what we had learned, and that's really led me to where I am today. Well, you have easily become the expert in this field, and we are appreciative for that. So there are a number of ministry leaders out there like you are in their first marriages. They probably haven't thought as deeply. Well, I know they haven't as deeply as you have. I don't think anybody's thought as deeply about it as you have. How prepared are our church, churches to deal with step families today, our ministry leaders? How, how, how are they doing? Well, let me just say I'm encouraged <laughs> because it used to be we were totally unprepared and nobody had even given it a thought. And now I, I'm happy to say that I see that tide changing, that people are coming to me, pastors are coming to me going, you know, we're thinking through our children's ministry. We have kids who are only here one or two Sundays a month. Should that affect our curriculum? And I say, absolutely. You know, they're starting to think it through a little bit. And so I'm not having to do all the work for the first time. And that's really encouraging to me. At the same time, I'll be honest. And I'll say, Ron, if it wasn't for folks like you at D6, given me an opportunity to talk to ministry leaders, a lot of people still haven't given much thought to this. See, here's the trap we fall into. The trap is, oh, well, we do marriage ministry. We have premarital counseling. Oh, we do parent training. Oh, we do. And the assumption is that those answers fit for step families as well. And I say, well, some of them do, but some of them don't. Or the timing of those answers is very different. And there's a whole lot of new stuff that you'd never even thought about before. And if you don't get that right, what you do give them is not going to be enough. You know, the average marriage ministry gives them about half of what they need. Mm. So you've got to just ask a new set of questions uh, so that you're in a, in a position of helping. Let me, let me just give one illustration for those that are listening that maybe have never even thought about this before. 
consider this one thought. In a, in a biological first family home, all right, first marriage home, two parents raising their biological children, all the relationships move in one fluid direction. So if dad spends time with his son, that warms mom's heart too, right? It improves his marriage and his parenting with his child. If mom spends time with their daughter, dad's happy about that. You know, it, it, all the relationships are benefited by that because they're, they're all moving in one direction. In a step family on day one, you have a you have a bifurcation going on. So if dad spends time with his child, stepmom feels left out. Uh, it, it, she may even feel like, wow, he prioritizes his son over me. So now the marriage is in jeopardy because of the relationship with the child. And then vice versa. If dad spends time with his new wife, the child feels, wow, what happened? I lost dad. Some her in this mix. Um, he's now giving himself to her. The child is not invested in the couple's marriage on day one the way the couple is invested in their marriage. Kids could take it or leave it sometimes. Sometimes they're just flat opposed to it. That's pretty rare. Um, but even if they're happy about dad's new marriage and the stepmom in their life, they're also a little confused because that makes my mom feel like she's left out. And so liking my stepmom is a problem for me as a kid because now I'm not sure if I've hurt my mom's feelings. You see, there's division and the relationships are moving in two different directions at two different speeds, and sometimes they're just flat competing with one another. That one simple reality is fundamentally different and changes the dynamic of the step family home in a way that we just have to think through all of those implications as it relates to how we do ministry. You know, you've described and brought back some flashbacks from my teenage years when I was younger. My parents separated and around age 14 divorced. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I remember living in those silos, worried about the opposite family members' feelings and siloing off those emotions one from the other, and uh, not 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 fun. Uh, so, mm. I, I you know, I talked about whether or not ministry leaders are prepared. What are they feeling on this? Let's let's reverse that equation. What are step families feeling most? What are they having to grapple with and deal with in this equation? Yeah, you know, um, love is the thing that brings them together, uh, but then they still have to figure out, uh, now what do we do about this complexity, these different relationships? How do I ma navigate this? If I'm the biological dad in the example I was just giving, you know, how do I love my son and my wife at the same time, even if they don't necessarily know how to love each other, and I get caught in the middle, and I hear both sides, and what do I do, and how do I support and at either end, and it feels like somebody's always losing. Well, it's not that somebody's losing it, but it, but it is that somebody feels outside of the relationship with the other two. So, you know, there's just a lot to navigate. And so they're trying to figure that out. By the way, they're not necessarily worried about this on the front end. One of the big dynamics that we frequently see in ministry settings is couples premaritally, um, you know, they're living on the dream and the train's moving fast down the track at 100 miles an hour. And even if we have opportunity to show them, here's some things that you might experience in your home once you get married. They often don't necessarily take that to heart or can't see it or feel it. And so it, it blindsides them. You know, the, the, the first six months or maybe, you know, a year and a half in, they're really asking hard questions and they're wondering if they made a mistake. And of course, the answer is no. They just need to have some answers and some guidance and, some, and support. So that's, that's the questions they're asking. Thank you so much for joining us today and walking people through such a practical approach to step family ministry. If I could give you one more tip, I'll mention we're doing a free live stream event called Blended and Blessed next April uh, 2017. Uh, churches can host it for free. Couples can jump online on their mobile device, their computer, and be a part of it. Part of the reason we're doing this, Ron, is because it goes around the shame issue. They don't have to walk into a church building, although we want them to, and we hope churches will host it so people will come together in a local church. But couples don't have to do that if they don't want to. We'll get them plugged in after the event. But Blended and Blessed, the first ever worldwide live stream to help step family couples. Everybody needs to plug into that event, April 2017. That's tremendous. Thanks for sharing that, Ron, and thanks for being with us. And again, if you don't have Ron's resource, he didn't come on to, to promote those, but I am. I'm going to do it. You need to check those out, and you need to be part of this live streaming event. Thanks, Ron, again for being here. Thank you. Take care.
you got to understand that Ron Deal is literally the best voice out there on this subject. So uh, I think that might have been obvious listening to him, but I hope if it wasn't, you get the idea that uh, it's a blessing to hear from Ron. So thankful that uh, he was able and willing to share it with us. Hey, this has been a great episode. I hope you had a great Christmas. Ron, we're heading towards the new year. That's right. That's right. And, you know, it, it's a chance for people to reflect. It's a chance to look ahead. It's a chance to do some planning. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'm going to go to bat for these two uh, incredible speakers we just interviewed. You may not have a need for either one of their books. My guess is you probably do. But you probably need to buy two or three copies and have them sitting on your shelf for when somebody walks into your office. They don't have to wait for Amazon or somebody else to deliver it. You can put a copy in their hands right now. Yeah. And as we head towards the new year, uh, next Tuesday, we're going to have a great episode to start the new year out with. Uh, we're going to have Josh Mulvihill with us, and uh, you're going to have Rodney Cox. That's right. Two great uh, gifted speakers, Josh Mulvihill. You know, if Ron Deal's known for step families, Josh Mulvihill is coming is the up and coming leader and voice for grandparenting ministry. And you notice I didn't say senior ministry; I said grandparenting ministry. That's what he's going to be talking on. And Rodney Cox, he's going to be talking about uh, how we find compatibility in our differences within our relationships. We're all different. And usually that that is very evident in our marriages and between our kids. There's one child in our family that we find it more difficult uh, to connect with, and he's going to walk us through that biblically. Well, as we close out this year, I think it's a great and fitting time to just say thank you to you guys as our listeners. Uh, You mean the world to us. Uh, We love to connect with you. You can uh, send us an email, info at d6leader.net. And uh, I think it's a good, I think Ron had kind of shared that he would love to just kind of pray with you guys as we end the year. And uh, and I'm going to just go ahead and sign off so when he says amen, we can be done with the show. Uh, thank you all for being with us. We'll see you next Tuesday. And uh, Ron just wants to spend some time praying for you as we close out this year. God, thank you for our listeners. Thank you for their attentiveness. Uh, they, they tune in weekly. there. I pray that this is an encouragement, but I pray most of all that their time in Scripture is an encouragement, and this is just kind of a little extra bonus along the way. I pray, Lord, that this is the end of the year and this new year, and there's reflection time and looking around. And every time we hear uh, a podcast or we read a book, sometimes it makes us feel like we don't measure up. And Lord, I pray that guilt and shame is not what accompanies these podcasts or books or speakers that we hear, but we do hear a challenge uh, we, we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit to just continue to get better, to get stronger, and uh, fulfill what you're calling us to do. And so I pray, Lord, as uh, many of these ministers have just gone through what most family members would get a break, most ministry leaders are getting anything but a break, but somewhere through this that you would redeem some time for them to relax, that they would be able to unplug and plug solidly into their families and into your word and help them to launch into the new year with a renewed, recalibrated, reinvigorated spirit ready to tackle the year at hand. In your name, amen. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com. And if you're a minister, we invite you to join the D6 Leader Network by going to d6leader.net. 